All righty. Well, I appreciate y'all allowing me to come and visit with y'all and share with you from uh, God's word. And uh, the, the text uh, this morning will be Psalm 34. It's one of my favorite Psalms and probably some of you uh, feel the same way about this Psalm. It is so rich because it is talking about uh, God's as a provider and a deliverer. He delivers from trials and he provides us for all of our, our needs. And uh, we, I have a picture here, uh, I put a lot of grapes in the background to symbol, be symbolic of God's provision. And then I have this man drowning, uh, holding up for help, uh, kind of like uh, Apostle Peter, when he says, save me, Lord. And uh, Jesus uh, showed that I am going to restore your faith so you can see something and feel something and get back on your feet and back on, on, on the boat. Well, that's the way God works. And he is our provider and deliverer. Now, in looking uh, at our time, we are living in very, what I call tumultuous times. And you might uh, uh, figure out some more colorful words uh, about uh, these times. It, it's kind of rough and sometimes kind of scary. I mean, uh, and I have the waves in the background be symbolic of our, our times, uh, very traumatic. But we've had things like uh, in the last few years, we've had horrible earthquakes. We have had uh, tornadoes. Of course, we all live in Tornado Alley. And uh, we've had uh, horrible floods. And we have had wildfires. And we have uh, terrorist attacks. And then now we have virus attacks. Now, we see all these things, and you can add your own personal experiences to this list. Some of us are having relationship and family issues. We have health issues, financial issues, you name it, and we've got it. And so when we have issues like this, uh, we ask this question, how do we live in times such as this? How do we cope? Well, so to make sure that this is not a rhetorical question, we would always want to seek out an expert to answer this question. And we are going to check out, uh, we, we're going to uh, consult an expert this morning, King David. Because see, if you, uh, no matter what you think about in a trial or trib you may have experienced, David could say, yeah. I've been there, I've done that, I've experienced that. In fact, I wrote about it. And that's why we have a psalm for just about anything that could come up in your life. And so it's, it's, it's exciting. And so we're going to uh, take a look at what King David has to share with us so we can cope. And I believe it'll be incredibly encouraging. So let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you open our hearts by the, your spirit and you will uh, bring uh, what David has shared on pen uh, to us, uh, your great psalm for our encouragement. And I pray, Father, that we will apply it to our lives and we'll remember these things. So when we uh, do come into situations, uh, those uh, uh, truths will uh, come to our mind. So, Lord, we bring this up to you. We want you to be exalted. We want you uh, to be praised. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I have a picture here to give some background of David's situation that brought him to write in this psalm. I have a picture of his mighty men. It took a while to get these guys to sit long enough to get this picture. So I'm real proud of this picture, okay? And uh, you see, I have inserted a picture of David because he wasn't uh, the king yet. And uh, uh, he, uh, in 1 Samuel 21, gives us the background of what he was going through. Now, first of all, he had been in, in uh, verse 
eight to nine, he had been fleeing from, from Saul. He, he was fleeing for his life. And uh, uh, everywhere he started, Saul wanted to kill him. And so he was uh, running uh, for his life and he runs into the worship center and he, he hits up the priest and he says, oh, I, I left my sword in, in my other pants. Do you have a sword? Please. I mean, that's kind of strange. I mean, that's like going into the church office and say, hey, Pastor, you got a gun? Of course, in Texas, oh, well, you want a, you want a Glock or do you want a revolver? What kind of ammo you prefer? But this was in Texas. So he had to uh, uh, ask for a sword. And he said, the only sword I got is the one Goliath had. <gasps> oh, yes, that's a great sword. Give it to me. And so he takes it and then he does something really amazing. It's either quite brilliant or totally foolish. He hides in the enemy camp. He hides with the Philistines. Well, it could be brilliant because who would be looking for him in there? He would be kind of some protection. But there's one big problem. Uh, everyone there would recognize uh, Goliath's sword. I mean, that was a big sword. He's probably dragging it along the ground when he was carrying it on. Hey, look, there's Goliath's sword. Oh, that's David. That's David. Well, they captured him and they took him over to King Achish. And uh, the men were standing there and the king was standing there. And David knew he was toast. He was toast. And uh, more brilliance came to his mind. And he decided he would act like a totally blooming lunatic. And so he would start drooling down his, on his beard, you know, slob, and just dribbling down. And, and he started scribbling on the wall, uh, I mean, on the gate, the city gate. I don't know where he got his Sharpie, but he was really a going to town with it. And uh, the king was standing there watching this. And uh, the men were standing there watching. And there is, uh, my daughter always had an expression or a word that would describe this moment. The word was awkward. And so uh, the king said, gentlemen, gentlemen, uh, do I lack madmen in my kingdom that you must bring this man to me? Well, talk about the embarrassment. They're sitting there kind of, oh, no answer for that. So in their embarrassment, they let him go fantastic it worked they let him go so in his acting insane uh it worked and of course he gives god the glory but uh he escapes and he goes through some very rough terrain and he goes to a place called the cave of adullam cave of adullam some of you may have been there a lot of people like to go there today and and hide where david hid but uh, here it is, uh, the little cave. He goes in there, very rough terrain. Uh, but in that, those days, who would, who would go there uh, to find him? And so he's in that cave, and his heart is pounding inside. And, and on the outside, the Holy Spirit is pounding on him. So he's getting it from both sides, and he writes this most fantastic psalm, Psalm 34, to write about his experience. And so here it is. Some of you may recognize it. <laughs> uh, now, now we got to remember in Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. You got to go a different direction. And so uh, I, and each line is a verse. This is the first uh, five verses. And I noticed something quite interesting when I was translating it. I observed that each verse started with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, in the order of the alphabet. And I had learned in the past that they would do that sometime to help us memorize. Well, we do that today. 
Uh, we, we'd have a way to uh, think of the next line. And this is what they did. And you have, you have the Aleph, you have the Bay, you have the Gamal, the, the Dalit, and the Hay. And then wait a minute, the next, the next letter in the he Hebrew alphabet is the Vav, and this ain't no Vav. This is the Zion. What happened to the Vav? Oh, David, you messed up because you've got 22 verses and you have 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And so you're going to run out of letters by the time you get to 22. What were you thinking? Why did you skip the letter Bob? That's what he skipped right there. That's not too difficult. So uh, he would have to start it all over. And uh, see, the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the Tav, the Tav. And so naturally, that would be a uh, fall on verse 21, which it did. Well, the next verse, then it, I guess he would have to start all over and start with the Aleph, which in, in English, that's uh, synonymous to A. Okay. Well, he didn't do that. He went to the pay. The pay. Now this is really getting weird. And I got to thinking, pay. Why did he start with the pay? There's got to be a reason. And so I decided to, you know, now verse 22 says, the Lord redeems the soul of the ser his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So I looked at the pay verse in the body of the text and, and it's verse 16. And it says, the face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Oh, wow, David, you're brilliant. You were wanting to bring attention to the contrast of what God is gonna do for the righteous and what God is gonna do to the wicked. Now. I call ourselves righteous because we've been declared righteous because we're in Christ and Christ is our righteousness. He imputes his righteousness upon us if we have placed uh, uh, him as our savior, put our trust in him as our savior. And so we're, uh, the righteous are happy and the, the wicked are, are not so happy. But he wanted us to connect those two verses I thought, wow, this is amazing. Uh, and, and being in a cave, and he still has this brilliance. This, this is incredible. So let's, let's take a look at the text. Now, he starts out, obviously, with praise. Now, when we pray and talk about the Lord, we ought to start with praise. He starts with praise, and he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Now, this bless is the kind of bless that is more of a uh, an humble uh, type of bless. It's not, I'm above you and I'm going to bless you, uh, like say the Pope blesses someone. No, this is an adoration with bended knee. He recognized who God is and he blesses him at all times. He says in uh, Psalm 103, one to three, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me Bless his holy name, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Wow, that is blessing the Lord. And that should be uh, echoed in our prayers and realizing who we are talking to. Do you realize we have a, a privilege to actually talk to our creator in a personal way, as a personal relationship? Oh, I've often been sitting and thinking, you know, I just feel so good and there's just no reason I feel so good. What am I feeling so good? And I start thinking, I start thinking backwards and I realize, wait a minute, I'm just subconsciously rejoicing in my salvation. It's, in, it's just amazing. Our salvation, we, it's so hard to get our head around it. It's so incredible. Uh, there's 33 things that happen to you when you accept Christ as your savior. It, you can list them all down. In other words, a whole bunch of things happen to you. 33 things that we've been able to identify so far. 
And when we get uh, to heaven, the Lord says, hey, you, know, you thought I was 33? I got a few more for you, okay? So that's going to be exciting. But he says, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So let's take a look at this. My soul boast in the Lord. Yes, you can boast, but it's boasting in the Lord. It reminds me of Mark 5, uh, 18 to 20. Uh, it's kind of an interesting situation. He, he re, uh, gets these demons out, of, casts these demons out of this guy, and, and he's so excited, and he wants to follow Jesus, and he says, and Jesus says, no, no, I want you to go home, tell your family and all your friends and relatives about what God has done for you. In other words, I want you to go all the way to town and boast about the Lord. That's what we can do. And that's what David wanted to do. He says, my, boat, my, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. And then he says, and because of that, the humble, the humble, uh, those who are really downtrodden, uh, say, I'm, I'm just just don't have it really, really that great. I'm just kind of a nobody and kind of behind the scenes. And then when he hears a testimony of what God is doing, he says, you know what? God's good to me too. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Uh, if you, and, and, and let us exalt his name together uh, or, or zoom it. I, could, I tried to find that in the Hebrew. I couldn't find it, but, but I'm sure that would apply. But let's get together some way and, and let's do it together. And if you don't have anything to talk about what God is doing for you yet, maybe you hadn't thought of it, use my testimony. Let, let, let's praise what God did uh, for me. Uh, he, you know, we, Lord is my, we have a lot of, Lord is my provider. Uh, and we have, uh, the Lord is my healer. We have all kinds of names of God to bring out his attributes and what he does. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. We have all those names of the Lord. And in Proverbs 18, 10, it says, and the name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous runs into it and is safe. We can, we can uh, be uh, excited about that. But let's take a look at David said, okay, let me give you my testimony. Let me tell you what God has done for me. And so we can rejoice. Uh, you don't have to be creative. You can just listen to what David experienced. He says, I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked at him and were radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. By the way, that ashamed in the Hebrew means you'll never get disappointed. God always going to come through some way, somehow. And he's always the God of the third alternative. You think he's going to do this or this and he does something else. And he says, wow, he always throws another taco in your plate just to let you know that he's the one that provided it, okay? And so he said, I sought the Lord. It didn't mean that the Lord was, was lost. It means uh, this, this word for sought is seeking the Lord out in prayer and studying of his word. Prayer is talking to him and the word is, is he's talking to you and you interact with him as you seek the Lord and your devotions and really experience his presence. That's what David wants us to do. But he likes the idea of us doing it as a group. This poor man cried, talking about himself, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Now, the angel of the Lord, and in, 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 as you know, in the Old Testament is referring to the pre-incarnate Christ. But the, the Lord is there and he uses the word uh, heard. I, I looked up that word, and that is uh, shamia. Now, shamia is uh, not just hearing words. Um, I found out that shamia means I hear you, and I'm responding to what you're saying. I'm doing something about it. Uh, a good example of that is back in 9-11 in, uh, uh, in Ground Zero, when, when they were hollering out to uh, uh, George Bush about what had happened and, 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 and how awful this was, he says, 
I hear you. He didn't mean, I, I hear what you're saying. He said, I got a plan. I'm going to do something. I'm taking action. Don't worry. We're going to take care of this. That is the way why uh, David used this word, chamea, for, for hear. It's not just hearing. He, they don't have a, in Hebrew, they don't have a concept of just hearing words and do nothing. When, when, uh, and that's why Jesus says, he that has an ear, let him hear. In other words, he that has an ear, let him hear and respond. Respond, apply it to your life. So this is talking about deliverance here. God being a deliverer. Then he said, okay, David says, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admonish you a little bit. I don't want you to miss the key points of this. I'm going to tell you some things that you need to apply to your life. Okay, now, first of all, taste and see. Experience God and you will see. Don't wait to see, to experience. Get involved with the Lord and you will see and you will understand that uh, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. And this brings us to that Nahum 1.7, which many of you may have even memorized. So the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. That is our good Lord. Fantastic. And uh, so how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord. Now fear the Lord is a, an awesome respect. And uh, that is probably confusing to some people. Uh, fear the Lord. It doesn't mean you'd be afraid of him, but um, uh, David explains how to fear the Lord in a little bit. But fear the Lord, uh, you his saints, for those who fear him, there is no want. Now, in contrast, the young lions do lack and they suffer hunger. They're the king of the jungle. But uh, they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing because God is their king. God is a provider. God is their deliverer. And so we're looking here at the supply end of God's grace. Now, uh, I want to share with you an interesting experience. When I went to visit my parents, some of you may have uh, known my parents. We joined here back in 1956 uh, when the earth was still cooling. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, but so some of you may have known my dad, uh, John Norton and Nadine Norton. Uh, my dad sang in the choir. Sang, they called the Sanctuary Choir back then. And he sang with Dan Beam and all. But uh, they uh, eventually, they moved up to... Uh, um, uh, Spokane, Washington. And so I went up there to visit. And my dad loved to uh, open the, the patio door and he'd throw out raisins out on the patio. And the robins would come and they would have a feast. They loved those raisins. I'll pop, pop, pop. They're just loving it. Well, because when I first went up there and visited them, we stayed up kind of late, just visiting, getting caught up. Well, so he overslept the next morning. Guess what? Those robins wanted their raisins. <laughs> they were lined up on the glass patio door, pecking at the door. Where are our raisins? And I learned something from that. Those robins knew who their provider was. They knew the source. They knew who to ask. We should be that way. We should know who our provider is. That was a great lesson for me. They were so cute. <laughs> and uh, we, we made them happy. Okay. Now, David said, Okay, I've, I've admonished you a little bit. I'm going to give you some instructions. I'm going to explain some stuff because I want you to make sure you get it. He says, come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you to, to uh, fear the fear of the Lord. I will show you what this all means. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days uh, that he may see good? Keep your tongue from, first of all, he has a list. Keep your tongue 
uh, from evil. This is an outward manifestation of someone who fears the Lord. You're not going to have a tongue of evil. Uh, your lips will not be uh, speaking to see. You'll depart from evil and do good and seek peace and pursue it. If you have those things, they will be manifested kind of like um, the uh, fruit of the spirit in Galatians. And, uh, and this, this will uh, show at, in your life is your lifestyle and will please uh the lord so i was i decided to uh look at the word fruit uh you know we we, we want to uh, bear spiritual fruit and i found something very fascinating in the hebrew that i want to share with you uh the hebrew word for uh fruit is pari okay and uh uh pay uh Actually, it's pay. Now, by the way, before the Babylonian uh, captivity, the font for Hebrew was a little different looking and pay looked like a mouth. Okay, looked like lips and uh, uh, resh uh, looked more like a human head. And the uh, yod looked uh, like more of an arm and a hand. And I said, wait a minute, now this is really cool because the letters are saying fruit is what you say, what you think, and what you do. Everything. And that's even, that's in the Hebrew word. <laughs> Very pictorial. And that's why I tell people, you know, if you get to learn Hebrew, you get to see everything in living color instead of black and white. You get to see it three dimension instead of two dimensions. So he goes on, explains a little bit more of uh, his uh, physical deliverance. He says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. Okay, though that is more of a uh, personification of God, so we can visualize uh, God coming down. Now, God gave us, I mean, God came, uh, Jesus, and, and we could see Jesus, and he, uh, uh, he, and he told Phillips, hey, you've seen me, you've seen Father, you know, and oh, yeah, okay, uh, well, anyway, that's, he brought that out because Philip needed a little special, special handling, but the uh, face of the Lord is against the evildoers and to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Remember, that's the pay verse uh, that it, what he was going to do uh, to the wicked. But that word cry, I looked that up and I wanted to get a, a specific understanding of that word cry. And that's the Hebrew word Shabbat. Now, this picture um, I got from a coloring book. And it was all black and white. And Ann told me, you can't show them a black and white picture. That's boring. You need some color. So she got her coloring uh, pencils and everything and gave us some color. And I thought that was, that makes it look a whole bunch better, don't you think? <laughs> okay, so you can thank her for that. And, uh, but, but that is uh, the crying out to the Lord for help. Lord, help me. Like, like uh, Peter, save me, okay? When, when we uh, get into trouble, we're hollering out, we cry out. To, that's what that cry is. But then he says, the righteous cry and the Lord hears. Well, you just told us this, you're repeating it. And I thought, well, let's look this up. And I found out it wasn't, on, it wasn't a repetition. What it was, was tzayak. It was a boohoo cry. It's a kind of cry when you're looking at your miserable situation that you're in and you're crying over it. Oh, woe is me. Oh, woe is me. And, uh, you know, you've heard that uh, song uh, uh, in Hee Haw, you know, if, if there weren't, weren't uh, what's that? If you hadn't, it, you know, what's it? Uh, uh, if you had no good, uh, I had no good luck. Yeah, something like that. I wouldn't have any luck at all. Uh, but anyway, uh, pardon me. But I just had this thing. I remembered that song. But but anyway, it's crying over your situation is what I'm trying to say. It's a boohoo cry. Now, there's not 
anything necessarily wrong with that, but that might be a stage in, in your, your condition. You may have already cried out to the Lord and he's taking some time. He's waiting until the fourth watch and he, uh, uh, and you're crying over it, or you may are crying over it right now. And then a little later, you're going to start crying out to the Lord because it's a little longer than you thought it was going to be. And you need, you need help. So there may be different stages, maybe the same thing. You're crying out for the Lord, you're crying over your situation. So he says he delivers them from out all their troubles and the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Now, this is the third stage. This is where you don't have any more tears anymore. You, you, you're, you, you realize you're in deep weeds. There's nothing you can do about it. And you're just kind of giving up. You're not crying anymore, but you're broken hearted and you're crushed. And that's, but, but he, he says, He's, he's still, he saves those um, in, in the crushed spirit. Uh, that is a physical salvation there. He takes care. He is still committed to you, no matter where you're crying out to the Lord or you're crying over your situation or you're not crying anymore and you're giving up. He's still committed to you. That is incredible. You don't program God he is already committed to you. Now, some of you may not be really got a handle on what uh, uh, a broken heart it is or crushing spirit. So I thought I would show you an example. Texas 28, Oklahoma 10. That is being crushed in spirit. <laughs> so uh, that uh, was he's referring to. But now he just said, well, you know, there's a spiritual deliverance too. I've been talking about the physical deliverance, but there's a spiritual deliverance. Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Uh, in fact, uh, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And then uh, he says, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. Okay. And the verse in uh, 2 Timothy 3.11 says, what uh, persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And he, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Now, the, this fascinating, you, he refers to the bones because in, in the, the Hebrew had this, this uh, concept of the seat, the seat of your emotions or in your bones. You've heard of people say, I feel it in my bones. Okay. Well, that's referring to. And uh, uh, so God is saying here uh, through Dave that, that uh, he uh, will uh, give you the emotional strength and the fortitude to go through your trial and trip. He will comfort your, your feelings too, uh, because that sometimes can be very torturous too. And uh, so he didn't leave that out. Also, I mean, you could be uh, hurting in the leg or hurting in your heart or something, but, but your emotions could be just terrifying. And that's also very important. But it also is an allusion to the fact that when Christ was on the cross dying for us, um, he didn't have any of his bones broken. That's a fulfilled prophecy there that has been embedded in this uh, Psalm. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. That is uh, hopefully that uh, we'll see some of this, that the evil schemes of the evildoers, that it will pounce upon them. They'll get trapped in their own traps like Haman, you know, in, uh, in Esther. Evil shall slay uh, the wicked. And in the last verse, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. That is our salvation. That is incredible. And um, because we are righteous, we have, we can look forward to that. Even when we're going through the pain here and now, we got something, we have so many great things to look forward to that we can't even, we do not have enough legal pads to list everything God has for us. But one of the things we can remember, Peter told us that, um, uh, uh, that uh, he has a, a theft protection on our 
uh, inheritance. He says, I've got it all protected by my word and locked up in heaven, so you ain't going to lose it. And uh, in fact, when he said that I've adopted you as adult sons, uh, in, in Roman law, uh, when you're adopted, uh, that, that's a one-way street. You cannot disinherit an adopted child. You can uh, a physical born child, but not an adopted child. That's our eternal security. And uh, also, the, I found out from some legal authorities, that's the same law here in Texas. But also, he said that uh, the word that he used, he's adopted us as, as uh, his children. It's adults. When you're 18 years old, you're considered an adult and the, and the parent can sign off and secure your uh, inheritance and that can never be revoked. So our inheritance is locked in uh, kind of like life law, you know? Uh, so no one can steal it. That is something so fantastic. Now, uh, let's take a look at uh, points to ponder. Um, now, one thing is pray, this is by the way, the Sea of Galilee, praise and exalt God together for his goodness, even in times of trouble. Um, when uh, Matthew Henry, this a great Bible expositor, uh, was robbed one time, and he says, oh, I'm so thankful. He says, thankful? How can you be thankful? You were robbed. He said, well, I'm thankful that I, I hadn't been robbed before. And I'm, I'm thankful that they took my money and not my life. And I'm also thankful that I didn't have much with me, so they didn't get much. And I'm thankful that I wasn't the robber, but I was one being robbed. So he had four things he was thankful for. That's creative. Be thankful in all things. Uh, grow in the knowledge of God's grace and love by seeking him out, just like David did. And trust that God is always intimately and continually at work in our lives, no matter whether we feel his presence or not. So our part is to magnify the Lord, cry out to him, seek him out, fear the Lord, trust in him, and depart, depart from evil. But God's part, uh, he's going to hear us, he delivers us, he saves us, he keeps us, he redeems us, and he draws near to us in all times. Wow. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And he is faithful to hear that prayer, faithful to take action. That is the God we have. And so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your encouragement. Thank you for being committed to us and help us by your spirit for us to be committed to you and strengthen our faith and help us to want to walk in holiness as well as walking in holiness. Lord, we want to please you. We want to exalt you in our lifestyle. So Lord, by the power